Hi everyone, how are you doing? This is Michelle Thorne from Bain. I wanna take a moment to welcome you to our October webinar. Um, so as you know, Bain, Differently Abled Mothers Empowerment Society, we seek to take a holistic approach to helping mothers who are raising special needs children. And one of the ways that we do this is with our webinar series. Um, we know that it is very difficult for many of us to get out to different conferences and to hear talks like the one that Denise is gonna give us today. And so what we're trying to do is provide that to our members so that these kinds of talks and opportunities are available 24 seven on our website or on our mobile app. Um, so today we are so excited to have Denise Voigt. Did I say your last name right? Yeah. All right, cool. Denise Voigt with us. Um, Denise is a clinical nutritionist um, she has a master's degree in human nutrition and functional medicine, which, whoa, like, I can't wait to hear what that's all about. Um, and Denise got into this um, business because her son was diagnosed with ADHD. And so in helping her son, she learned a lot and kind of, you know, I think just picked it up and ran with it. And it's become a very big passion for her. Um, so, Denise, I'm so thrilled to have you with us today, and I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my mic and my camera, and you can take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so as Michelle said, I'm Denise Voigt, and I am a functional medicine nutritionist, and I specialize in working with families uh, with autism and ADHD. So how I got into this, as Michelle said, is that my son was diagnosed with severe ADHD as a young one, and we struggled, and they wanted to put him on medication. He had extreme behavior issues, and it also manifested into physical issues, so he had um, stomach issues and rashes and headaches and asthma and we had um, a boatload a laundry list of problems and he did invasive tests they tried to do colonoscopy endoscopy we had boatload supply of Miralax on hand at all times because that seemed to be everything that the doctors kept pushing on us um, and I met a naturopathic physician who was a functional medicine practitioner and I'd never heard of that before and luckily for us, he treated uh, my son, Devin, and introduced us to specialty diets and leaky gut and nutrients and supplements and um, it miraculously uh, changed my family. So um, I took that and changed trajectory of my profession and my career. And I went to school, got my master's degree in a new program in nutrition and functional medicine, which was the first of its kind in the country. And it was amazing. And um, ever since then, I take my passion. I'm trying to help other families to not make some of the mistakes that we made when trying to make some of these changes. But I also want people to understand how important um, a good baseline nutrition uh, program is for your kids. Because, you know, just as this presentation will show, um, you know, the food and nutrients that you're feeding your kids affect their health their learning and their behavior. And this presentation is gonna be you know, geared towards kids, but honestly, this is for anyone, all individuals um, with autism and ADHD. And in addition to that, it will benefit your whole family. So with that said, um, the other question I get asked a lot is what, is, what is functional medicine? What is a functional medicine nutritionist? So a functional medicine nutritionist is based on the sort of a corner of medicine called functional medicine, which really addresses the root cause of problems rather than compartmentalizing, uh, you know, like the cardiovascular system and the hormone system and the detoxification system. It really looks at it as a, a whole systems biology approach where nothing in the body really works in unison and it's all affects each other. So looking at the root cause and when you think about that, the first thing I always think about, and I know I'm biased because I'm a nutritionist, but the first thing I think about is your nutrition. What are you putting in your body to support your physiology? So that being said, we'll go through our presentation and uh, see how it goes. So in this webinar, um, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about the ways you can improve your child's uh, health, learning, and behavior by modifying their diet. 
So by the end of this presentation, hopefully you'll know which foods are going to aggravate their system and which ones will help support and nourish. So the, the first thing um, that I like to talk about is how most of the food that we're feeding our children isn't actually food. Um, it's full of toxins and chemicals and sugar and it's overly sweetened, it's overly salted um, and has hydrogenated toxic fats in it. And this image here is a perfect you know, indicator. It's, it's the beige diet, right? And that missing piece is the greens and the veggies and those nutrient dense foods. So all of those processed, highly sugared and chemically filled foods are damaging um, our brains. So research shows that kids on the spectrum and with ADHD are, they just happen to be particularly sensitive to these chemicals. Uh, they have a hard time uh, detoxifying sometimes and it, it causes them a little bit more struggle and damage than it does um, just a neurotypical child. But in the end, all of the things that we're going to talk about here, will you will benefit from it whether you have ADHD, autism, or, or not. It, this is something that everybody should be eating like this, so hopefully you'll take away from this that. So um, there's some things that we talk about quite often uh, with kids on the spectrum and with ADHD is they, they commonly have food allergies, food sensitivities, some intolerances, gastrointestinal disorders, immune system dysfunctions, um, detoxification dysfunctions, methylation issues, and, and there's a boatload more. But these are the reasons why uh, this particular population is a little bit more sensitive to some of these toxins in our food. So when it comes to changing diet, most parents feel completely overwhelmed. When people first come to me and they're talking about a specialty diet for autism or ADHD, they start, you know, oh, should we do keto, paleo, uh, specific carbohydrate diet, the GAPS diet, uh, GFCF. There's, I mean, there's a laundry list of different specialty diets. And so they, they're completely overwhelmed, so they're not sure where to start. They feel like there's no time. They're so busy running around. Some of my clients, I mean, they have 20, 30, 40 hours worth of therapies a week for their kids. There's ABA therapy, speech therapy, um, kids uh, in school or in soccer and baseball and ballet. And, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And mom's working, dad's working, everyone's busy. And they feel like they just don't have time to make the dietary changes. They feel like they think it's going to be hours in the kitchen that they just don't have. They also have many battles. So if any of you are struggling with kids that um, are, you know, trying your patients on a daily basis, you know that the battle for little things just to get them dressed in the morning sometimes is a battle. Um, by the end of the day and all the battles you've had at the end of the day many of my families tell me they don't they don't want to have to cook and do all these you know special things and then just to have the child refuse the food anyway so they feel like i, I just denise i can't do this so i hear that quite often but what i really want to get across to you that that is so important is that the food that your children are eating directly affects their health learning and behavior so I really want you to soak that in as we go through this, because that is the mainstay. You are your child's best advocate, and everything that goes into their mouth sends a chemical message in their body, and it could be a good message or it could be a bad message. And so um, I really want you to, to let that sink in. So our top priority, our, our very first thing, the, the main goal is to clean out the toxins. Since the things we were talking about earlier, some of our detoxification issues, um, gut issues, the toxins that are in our food are really damaging to our children's brain and their health, um, which then has the outward expression in their behavior. So um, that's going to be our top priority. So we're going to go through a list. Um, number one, one of the main uh, toxins that I try to get families to remove from their diet is artificial colors and flavors. Uh, kids are particularly sensitive to these and they're in just about everything. Um, I, what I like to show, sometimes I show some images of, of what these chemicals are really made from, but the truth is they, they really come from petroleum and refined um, fuels that, that make, they make gasoline and motor oil. And this is, this is in your children's food. So those cute little shaped gummy fluorescent snacks that you're feeding your kid. Yeah, that's the same stuff that's in your motor oil. So, um, 
think about that as your your child is struggling and then well, the impact of that is behavior problems. Um, high levels of phenols are, are in these chemicals. And so those are really hard to process and detoxify. And um, some of these kids are just unable to metabolize those. So it damages the nervous system and exasperates many of the symptoms we see in autism. And it certainly, um, you'll, we'll see it in kids with ADHD and, and cause hyperactivity. So the second one we talk about is artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners are what exactly what they're labeled. They're artificial. So they're chemically made and they definitely have some serious uh, health risks. And just because they are not sugar does not mean that they're better choice than sugar. So don't be fooled by advertising. If something says diet or no sugar um, things like that. You need to read your labels and make sure that there's not some kind of chemical in there that has replaced that sugar. So these chemicals, they're neurotoxic, and that means that they're toxic to the brain. So when we talk about behavior issues or learning disabilities or any kind of dysfunction, the first thing we want to think about is our brain health. And if we're poisoning our brain with these kind of toxins in a diet soda or any kind of diet drink, and that most people just refer back to diet soda, but there's like diet teas and diet lemonade. And, and many people make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, this has less sugar and less calories. So this must be better for me, but it's actually more toxic for you than the sugar. So the third one is artificial preservatives. Now, these are things that are put in food to preserve them so that they can hang out on your shelf for a million years, right? So if most natural and whole foods, right, they'll start to mold or rot or things like that. So if you were in the food industry and you were trying to make a profit off of your product, you want that sucker to be able to sit on the shelf for as long as possible, right? Because if it goes bad, then you're going to lose money and you can't sell it. So one of the ways they do this is by putting extra preservatives in there to keep that food, I say that term loosely, uh, on the shelf for as long as possible. Well, unfortunately, uh, these preservatives have a, a laundry list of side effects and problems that they cause, especially in the population that isn't detoxifying well. So we'll see respiratory issues. That's one I see quite a bit of. Um, I know personally, when we stopped uh, allowing my son to have preserved foods, his asthma went away. Uh, which was quite an impact for our family because we had the nebulizer and I, he would fall asleep and I'd be holding the mask over his face because he wouldn't allow me to put the mask on his face. So that was fun. Uh, skin issues, so psoriasis, um, just rashes in general, dry skin, flaky skin, sensitive skin, we see that quite often. Cancer, aggravate ASD and ADHD symptoms. You're gonna probably see that one on every slide because all of these toxins really aggravate these um, symptoms that we see, the outward behaviors, some of the, the stimming that get, will get more, more aggressive when um, they're, they're being poisoned, really, is, is how I, I look at it. Number four is hydrogenated oils and trans fats. Now this one, ugh, this one is uh, really disappointing because it, it's hard to get away from them. Um, things like margarine and those things are, are the obvious where people say, oh, we know trans fats are bad. But when you eat at restaurant foods or when you're eating out, typically whatever you're eating that's fried or has oil in it, it's going to be hydrogenated. And what that means is that it's oxidized. The oil has been either heated to a really high heat or they use some kind of heavy metal to turn that liquid into a solid um, so that it can be put in food for texture, for, for taste. <laughs> at this point, that sounds disgusting, but... Um, it's not. It makes it taste better, the, the texture of it. So these oils in particular um, cause major problems. Um, there, here's our just a short list of the things. The reason that they put them in there mainly is because they're cheap and they help with that long shelf life of foods. They raise our LDL, they lower our HDL. So LDL is what they consider our bad cholesterol and the HDL is the good. So we, it increases our risk of cancer, diabetes, obesity, infertility, um, you know, causes inflammation and, and probably the stem of most issues that we have nowadays, whether it be diabetes, obesity, ASD, um, autism, there's, well, ASD is autism, thank you, but inflammation is the 
the root cause of a lot of these problems. So um, unfortunately, this, these kids are particularly sensitive to it and they have a hard time breaking them down. So, um, and also yet yeah, they interfere with the enzyme activity that converts omega-3 acids into their um, active form. And we all know how important omega-3s are for brain health um, and function. Uh, our fifth one we're going to talk about is MSG. So this is monosodium glutamate. This is found in many foods. Um, I, maybe if you've heard it for a while there, they talked about it being very common in um, Asian cuisine and takeout, Chinese takeout. But it's actually in a lot of products, and they hide it under a lot of different names. Um, sometimes we'll just call it the monosodium glutamate because for the longest time, everyone just knew it as MSG. But um, at the end of this presentation, you'll be getting a link to a checklist of um, toxic ingredients that we go over here. And it'll also have a section where it'll tell you what other names that this toxin is, is labeled under on your, on your food labels. So um, it's particularly, it's a flavor enhancer and it has glutamate in it, which is an excitotoxin. And what that means is that it can excite the nerve, ner neurons so much that they die. Um, they, they get so excited, they, they kill themselves off. Uh, so too much glutamate um, can't be processed for kids on the spectrum. It's a real problem. Uh, and so it builds up in the system and starts to become toxic to their brain. It can cause headaches, neuroinflammation. So neuroinflammation means inflammation of the brain. Uh, hyperactivity, diarrhea, depression, respiratory problems. So um, it also can contribute to, you know, addiction. So the MSG can cause addictive behavior. And if you have a kid who really only likes that one brand of chicken nuggets or that one particular drive through French fry or something like that, a lot of times it has something to do with a, a toxin like this. MSG is highly addictive. And so it will um, not only are kids, uh, you know, very particular and are picky eaters, but this can contribute to that because they're truly addicted to it. Number six, pesticides. So I'm sure many of you have heard of glyphosate and all the controversy around Roundup and, and those kind of things. But the truth is, is, is that's how farmers are keeping their, um, their produce and plants from being eaten. And so they douse them with pesticides. And we'll talk about GMO in a second. But for now, um, knowing that these pesticides are truly, they're toxic. They are meant to kill. That's, that's what they do. Um, they kill pests. And so that being said, um, kids that have problems with detoxification are going to have a really hard time getting these pesticides out of their system. So when the, that toxicity builds up, it impairs brain development, brain function, um, and it's a real problem. So I love this quote from Dr. Sears, put junk food into a child's brain, you get junk behavior, junk learning, junk mood. It's that simple. So it makes sense, right? If you're putting toxins in, um, you're going to get toxicity. And then toxicity is going to reflect in their behaviors, their outward expression. So what's going on on the inside will come out on the outside, whether it's behavior, sleeping issues, uh, diarrhea, uh, constipation, skin issues. Um, the laundry list goes on and on. And it all starts with the stuff we're putting in our mouth and calling food. Number seven, so we've got genetically modified organisms, GMOs. So basically what they've done in order to try to make crops last longer and, and protect them from, from pests and, and uh, fungi and other things that might kill the plant, they remove DNA from another organism um, and then insert that, that piece of DNA into the plant. So the downside to that is that sometimes they use um, you know, allergens like that, if, if it was taken from another animal or another plant that you're, you are allergic to, you're going to have a real problem. So that's one problem. Two, it comes along with something that they call junk DNA. And what the, the scientists say in that is that they don't really know what that other DNA that's coming along with it is. So they just assume it must be safe. Well, that's a heck of an assumption. So we don't have any long-term studies to show safety um, of GMOs, and we we're already seeing many uh, research uh, things being done showing growing tumors in rats and, and other things we don't, we don't want to see. Uh, 
it, it helps the plant withstand high levels of pesticide. But what I always ask is, okay, so if that plant just got doused with a boatload of pesticides and poison, what happens to the human that's now eating that plant? So that's fantastic that the plant got to live, but what about us that are consuming it? So again, there's no long-term safety studies and I wouldn't want to be the guinea pig. The other downside is here in the US, GMOs don't have to be labeled. You, it does not have to tell you that there is a genetically modified organism in the food you're eating. So what I recommend is shooting for organic. So if, if it's organic, it can't use genetically modified organisms in it. And a lot of times if you look for that stamp on your food product that says GMO project, um, that will ensure that they didn't use GMOs as well. And number eight, here's the big one. So refined sugar. This is our last toxic ingredient on the list. Um, and I think this one isn't, this isn't new news. Everybody kind of has ha got the word that sugar can be toxic and too much of it is a problem. And we are certainly eating way too much of it. You look at the statistics and we're, we're eating boatloads more than our, you know, previous generations were. So one of the things that happens when we have sugar is that it spikes your blood sugar and then that blood sugar will drop and that drop triggers an adrenaline rush and can disrupt hormones and cause real problems. It can cause uh, behavior issues, number one, but can cause major mood swings and aggression. And um, the body's just not set up to handle that kind of sugar intake that we're eating on a, on a regular basis. So has a negative impact on uh, behavior, attention, hyperactivity, aggression, mood, mental focus, can cause dizziness, fatigue, tremors, confusion. So I know this list is all, you know, ugly things. And most of us think of sugar and we think sweet and happy thoughts. But um, when we're given an excess, and unfortunately in our society, just about everything has an excess of sugar. Um, and the labels don't really reflect it very well. So here in the U.S., we typically measure in cups, teaspoons, um, tablespoons, but on the package, it's measured in grams. So most of us will look at it and say, oh, there's 15 grams of sugar. Is, is that a lot? I'm not sure. So to put it in perspective for you, every four grams of sugar is a teaspoon. So when you think about that, many times we'll see a small drink um, in the market and and it'll have 20 grams of sugar. Well, that if you would you put five teaspoons of sugar in this small amount of drink? Most likely not. But and then top of that, many times it is a concentrated sugar, so it's made into a syrup like high fructose corn syrup and hidden under names like maltodextrin, which is a corn sugar, and they they isolate and concentrate that sugar, which makes it even harder for us to process. Oh, in addition to that, it, it creates more cravings for sugar, which then is a perpetual cycle, right? Um, and so in addition to those eight toxins that I talked about, there's also the gluten and casein and, and other allergens, soy, nut. There's, there's some other uh, allergens out there that are really exasperating, especially for kids on the spectrum that are with ADHD. But that's a whole other topic in itself. We're going to save that for a presentation on its own. But to know that, yes, those are a problem too, but the priority really is getting out those main toxins. If you are going to try to do a specialty diet or try to do a removal of gluten and casein, but you're still eating these other toxins, you're still getting the artificial colors, artificial flavors, preservatives, hydrogenated oils, those are all toxic and they're, they're draining the detoxification pathways. So uh, a gluten and casein free diet might not be as effective for you if you don't get the the other baseline foundational diet underway. Uh, so we'll talk about that in another presentation. So uh, as I said, the priority is to reduce your toxic exposure. So uh, getting rid of the toxins, but increasing those nutrient dense foods. So that being said, now that we talked about all this stuff you, you shouldn't be eating or feeding your kids, let's talk about the stuff that you can feed them that will help them thrive, help their neurodevelopment, help their brain function properly, and then help us with those outward expressions of aggression and um, agitation and hyperactivity, okay? So here it is. We're going to spend some time on this slide because... Uh, this is what your perfectly planned plate should really look like. And I know in an ideal world, this would be wonderful. And the first thing that people tell me is like, oh my God, Denise, like, there's no way I'm going to be able to get my kids to eat like this. But trust me, you can. 
Um, so what I, I want you to focus on and think about is those non-starchy vegetables. And most of our kids are not eating any vegetables. And so that's part of my job as a functional medicine nutritionist. I try to teach people the tips and tricks on how to sneak in these veggies. And if you're going from a standard American diet where it's that, that beige bland diet of burgers and chicken nuggets and pizza and uh, things like that, it's very hard to get kids to eat something that's colorful with a different texture. And especially our picky eaters, they have a really hard time trying new foods. So we have lots of tips and tricks on how to do that. One of my favorite things to do is to hide them in a puree. So if you can get your kid to try to start eating smoothies, that's probably the easiest way to sneak in these nutrient dense vegetables. And why that's so important is because vegetables are the things that directly feed our cells. Um, our cells recognize those as nutrients, recognize it as food. It, they're very nourishing. They're anti-inflammatory. They're full of fiber. Each different color has its own array of phytonutrients in them. So that means that nutrients that come from plants. And so uh, most of us are not getting enough. They are the things that help boost our detoxification. They help boost our brain function. Um, they help boost our, our, our um, digestive path pathways. So when your kids are not eating vegetables, they're really missing out on that, the main nutrients they need for life. Um, if we're not giving our kids the building blocks they need to grow, then their rapidly developing brain and nervous system is going to fail, whether or not they're on the spectrum, just in general. So this is very important, and we, we definitely aren't seeing enough of it. But if you can get your kids to eat, if they like a, let's say they like a fruit smoothie, what I suggest is we start with the fruit smoothie and then we slowly kind of sneak in a little puree of a vegetables. The vegetables that are sweeter are like carrots and beets. You can kind of hide those in there. Um, many times we can hide pureed vegetables in a spaghetti sauce or um, things of that nature where you slowly build up their tolerance to it because here's, here's one of the problems with the standard American diet. It hijacks your taste buds. So if your kid is used to eating cookies and crackers and snacks and fast food and processed foods, their taste buds are not going to taste whole healthy foods the same way that they, sh they really should. And yeah, they're going to be bitter and they're not going to like it because they're used to that overly sweetened, overly salted, overly fatted um, foods that are rapidly turning to sh sugar in their body and causing real disturbances. So if you can try to sneak in more vegetables little at a time, and it doesn't happen overnight, I get that. It's not like you're gonna, I don't expect anybody to turn their standard plate into this plate at, right out the gate. But this is what you're striving for. This is what the body needs for function, for uh, to thrive. And that's what we all want for our kids, right? We want our kids to be healthy and happy and, and thrive. So vegetables are the top dog. They are, they are the number one. And then the second one that I like to talk about is those quality fats. Uh, most of us have been brainwashed um, to go low fat, low fat, fat is bad, fat causes cholesterol in the system. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's not true. So the, the truth is, is that our brain is 60% fatty tissue. Every cell in our body is surrounded by a lipid bio layer. That means there's two layers of fat around the cell that hold the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. It keeps our receptors stable so that the cells can hear messages from each other. If we don't get enough quality fat, just at the very basic cellular level, we're having dysfunction. Um, our nerves are surrounded by a myelin sheath that's made from fat, and it's what helps conduct our um, nerves to conduct their stimulation faster. So if we're having damage there, then our, our even just moving your muscles, that some of their movements, they can't do as well. They can't think uh, quickly. So getting those good, healthy quality fats in is super important. Those are things like avocado. Even you see butter in that picture. A lot of people look at me and they're like, wait, I can have butter. It's all about quantity or quality, not quantity. So it really isn't very relevant how many calories are in your food. What's relevant is the quality of those foods and the foods that you put in the body and their hormone response. So how your body responds to that food. I promise you 200 calories worth of Hershey's Kisses is going to have a completely different response than 200 calories worth of chicken and broccoli. Um, so what we were shooting for is to eat or feed our children with intention. What is our intention? We're trying to fuel their system for life, to grow, to learn. 
Um, and if we're filling them full of toxins and hydrogenated oils and things that, that are toxic to the brain, how, how can we expect them to go to school and sit down and behave um, and learn? We can't, it's, it's, it's not possible. So nuts, seeds, olive oil, olives, those are all really good, healthy sources of fat. Um, and it, it usually isn't very difficult to take, get kids to eat fat. Many kids, avocado, they like some guacamole or put an avocado spread on things, butter, that's a no-brainer. You can cook with it. Um, what I recommend is grass-fed butter. Again, it's about the quality, not the quantity. So if you're eating um, butter from, and I know a lot of people out there are saying, wait, if we're casein free, okay, so we can go with ghee. And to be honest with you, um, grass-fed butter has very little casein. Um, and ghee has been heated so that it, the casein rises to the top and they scoop it off. Then all you're left with is the clarified butter. So you can still have that clarified butter, even if you're on a casein-free diet. Um, but again, quality, thinking about where that food came from. So if you're eating butter that was come, come from a, a conventional cow that was pumped full of steroids and hormones and fed GMO corn and wheat and things that were there to make it get fat, well, guess what? You're, you're getting you know, your milk or your cheese or your butter from a, a toxic animal. It's toxic. So it's, it's really got to focus on that quality. Uh, same with the nuts. They trying to get organic so that you don't have something that was covered in pesticides. So you take this healthy thing and then you cover it with toxins. It's going to have a bad effect in the body. So the next one in the lineup that's super important is protein. And I'm sure most of you know how important protein is, protein, but not just for our muscles, right? It's not just for building muscles. Protein is pretty much the building block of everything in the body. So protein is broken down into amino acids. Then the amino acids are built back up and they make the proteins in our body. Our enzymes are proteins. All of our chemical reactions require these things. Um, our cells are breaking down and turning over and building again all the time, every day. And if we don't get those amino acids for those building blocks, then we're not going to be able to repair. So again, it's going to be about quality over quantity. So if we're talking about beef, we want grass-fed beef. Uh, cows were not um, capable of digesting uh, anything other than grass. They have this really intricate stomach system that allows them to absorb nutrients from grass, which to me is pretty amazing because they're ginormous and they can get that weight just from eating grass so it's pretty cool but if you feed them anything other than that which is what the farmers do to fatten them up because that's how they make a profit right the bigger the animal the more it sells for um then they're going to be toxic so um and it's kind of sad actually that that we destroy their system and get get them unhealthy in order to make them fatter but um, so that being said, grass-fed beef, we want pasture-raised pork. So if you're going to eat pork, you want it to be pasture-raised. Uh, fish, wild-caught. We want wild-caught fish. We see um, a lot of studies are showing that farm-raised fish have a laundry list of issues that we just don't have enough time to go into all of the details about each of these things. But um, wild-caught fish, and then we want, of course, organic poultry, um, cage-free uh, eggs. Um, and did I miss anything? So we've got wild caught fish, hash raised pork, organic chicken. Yeah. So again, we, we really want to think about the, the quality of the food. And if you're giving them things that are already toxic and expect them to have some kind of different effect in the body, it's not going to happen. Um, and then that little tiny smallest piece of that plate is our fruits and starchy carbohydrates. So what that means, starchy carbohydrates are things like potatoes, rices, beans, pastas, crackers, cookies, breads, uh, pretty much all of the things that the standard American diet is based off of, right? So most of us, the plate looks kind of skewed normally, uh, where that vegetable, if at all, is maybe the smallest part on the plate. And the biggest part on the plate is the starchy carbohydrates. It's, it's we're putting things on a bed of rice, right? We're putting on a bed of uh, pasta, in a tortilla, on a pizza crust. Well, that is all super high in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates turn to sugar in the body and our body cannot handle, as we talked about earlier, you know, most of us, when we think sugar, we think refined sugar and which is of course toxic, but all carbohydrates turn to sugar in the body. And when that happens, insulin comes in and it does its job. And it really has kind of two choices. It really either takes that uh, glucose and it stores it as glycogen storage in our muscle and our liver, or it stores it as fat. So insulin is a fat storing hormone. 
So if we're not active, which most kids are, but these days with technology and this kind of thing, um, if they're not playing sports and they're not running around, they're really not that active. So their glycogen storage is full. So the only other place for insulin to put that sugar is stored as fat. And even some of our kiddos that we don't see on the outside looking uh, fat or overweight, their organs are getting fat. They're storing fat. Um, and that's unhealthy. Not only that, but high amounts of carbohydrates can also muck up the mitochondria. And we know that this population already is sensitive in that arena. Their mitochondria are not functioning properly. Mitochondria are the little part of the cell that create our energy. So um, they're miraculous. They take those carbohydrates and kick out ATP, which is our cellular form of energy. But much like, um, like a fire, if you put a bunch of wood on the fire, that fire is going to go out. Well, that's kind of how the mitochondria is. If you flood it with too many carbohydrates and sugar, um, you're going to kill off that poor mitochondria. He's not going to be able to work. And that's where we're going to see a dip in energy. And so not just energy like, woohoo, energy, I'm going to go run a mile, but energy that is required to make our, our metabolism run our chemical reactions to happen. They all require ATP, which is our cellular energy, for our brain to function, for our body to move, for just about every chemical reaction in the body. It requires ATP. So if our mitochondria are not healthy and functioning optimally, we have a real problem. And so one of the biggest problems we have is that as a society as a whole, we're eating way too many carbohydrates. And many times we think our, our kids, because they're kids and they have a faster metabolism, that they can just have boatloads, donuts and cookies and um, very highly processed carbohydrates um, that come in the flour form. So that's a real problem for many reasons. Like we talked about earlier, that drop, that spike and that drop in blood sugar, it creates this roller coaster of mood swings all day. So our goal, we want to really keep that carbohydrates and blood sugar level very level. Um, so we don't have those peaks and valleys and spikes and dips. Um, and then the other thing to talk about is fruits. Now fruit is kind of a special animal. Most people don't talk about it this way because they think fruit is, you know, full of antioxidants. It's a healthy thing. We can have as much as we want. Um, and, and typically we use the word fruit and vegetables like it's one word. <laughs> It's not. Vegetables are definitely different than fruit. So the thing with fruit is that they have a high amount of fructose in them. And fructose is a very special sugar um, that can be very neurotoxic when had in high amounts. And it, it's hard to digest. It's hard to absorb. Uh, many of our kiddos have leaky gut and fructose is a problem for that. The other side to that too is fructose has, gets a VIP pass straight to the liver where it gets formed into triglycerides faster than any other sugar out there. Um, most people don't understand that because we've been told for so long that fruits are healthy, fruits are great, eat fruit. Um, but the truth is it doesn't go through the same regulatory process that the glucose does with the insulin and all that stuff. So it, it's a misunderstanding. People think that they can have as much fruit as they want. But the truth is that we really can't. Eating too much fruit is a problem and causes major disruption in the course. So what I tell people is that the best fruit that has the most bang for the buck is berries. Berries are super high in nutrients. They're high in fiber, um, but they have a low amount of fructose. So um, if your kids like berries, that's great. Um, of course, we'll talk about there's in another presentation, we'll talk about some of those specialty diets where fruit is an even bigger problem and we have to really be careful of it. But for the most part, we're eating too much fruit. We're eating too much starchy carbs in general. So that's why it is the smallest part of the plate. It is not something that we should be eating in abundance. Um, it's this all, it seems simple, but I am, I truly understand it is not easy. I've been on the other side of this. I know what it's like to try to get your family to convert to this kind of eating. But once you start learning the tips and tricks, I'm telling you, there's, there's so many wonderful, amazing ways to squeeze in nutrient-dense foods that will support your child's health, learning, and behavior. And if we can eliminate those toxins and replace them with these healthy foods, it's amazing the differences you're going to see in the outward expression of their life, whether it be their behavior, their sleeping, their pooping. Like all of these things will come together. Um, it's pretty miraculous. So that being said, we're going to wrap up uh, this portion of it. And I want to give you access 
to this toxic ingredient checklist that I made. And it goes through all of those toxic ingredients that we just talked about. It tells you what their, what their names are on the label. So what you can look for. And uh, many times there's some trickery in marketing and they try to hide the names under something different. So I try to do my best to give you as many of those names that um, I could. And then also where they're found, the types of food that those toxins are found in um, it, most of the time. Then there's also this getting started guide that just kind of recaps everything that I just said here, maybe in a little bit more detail to give you that sort of jump start. Like, where do I start? I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, many people have heard the gluten-free, casein-free diet, but if you don't have a handle on the things that we just talked about here, you're still going to struggle even on a gluten and casein-free diet. Yes, gluten and casein is a special um, animal. They there's, there's a whole lot of information there. And typically, one of the main reasons that they're a problem is because most kiddos don't have a good intact gut system. And those partially digested proteins, since they're very hard to digest, um, will seep out into the system. And they actually can mimic opioids and stimulate opioid receptors in the brain. And when that happens, you will get a much like a morphine-like effect, where not only are they addicted to these foods, uh, but they also have foggy brain and things that you would get if you were on, you know, medicated on morphine or, or drugs. So it's a real problem. Um, there's, there's other problems that come along with gluten and casein, and we can talk about that in another um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. But, and then if, if you want more information like this, if, if you found this useful, uh, you can follow me on social. So we've got an Instagram page. Uh, it's Denise.Voit and our Facebook is Denise, the Denise Voigt official because hey, someone else took Denise Voigt, so I had to go with, I had to add to it. Um, so I try to put useful information. I love getting questions. I would love for you guys to hop on there, join us in the conversation, support each other, ask questions. If no one's asking questions, then people don't know what what information to provide out there. And I try to do my best uh, to give that that solid information. I want to be a resource for you that it, you can trust. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I will find it for you. So please hop on there and join us. And that's the end of the presentation, Michelle. Awesome. Denise, that was so wonderful. Oh my God. I have so many pages of notes. Um, <laughs> so that, that was really great. Um, so guys who have been watching the presentation, I just opened up the chat bar. Um, so hopefully you can see it. Um, and if you can, you can um, start asking Denise some questions um, about her presentation and um, if you have any questions about nutrition. Um, I just think what you talked about was so pivotal because we always hear, I have two kids with autism at home, and the one thing that we always hear is gluten-free, casein-free. Right. But nobody ever managed you know, takes the time to talk about what you just talked about, yeah. which is all of the toxins that are in the food that we give them, regardless if they're gluten-free or casein-free. Right, which is why, th that's why it was the topic of this one, because most people expect me to start spouting off about gluten casein, and so already they're like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say. You're going to you're gonna talk to me about this, and that didn't work for me, or oh yeah, we're already on it, but they skip over the, all of this information, which, you know, as a functional medicine nutritionist, you have, I look at the whole system and I'm not just isolating one ingredient or one uh, thing. It's, it's how it, it functions in your whole system. If we are putting toxins in our body, now our, our population is, is super particularly special in the sense that they don't detoxify well. So these toxins are even more aggressive for them than they are for other people. But Everybody, the entire population, if you look around, we're suffering from chronic illnesses, left, right, and sideways. We've got heart disease, diabetes, you know, chronic illnesses that are not, you know, we're just masking symptoms with prescriptions. That's not going to help. Um, and even some of our kiddos that are being medicated with, um, you know, Ritalin or, or, I mean, there's a laundry list of medications that all these kids are on. But the truth is, is that pharmaceuticals and prescriptions are designed to downregulate one of the body's functions. And it can't really isolate that. You can't just pick one thing. You may be able to do that in a lab when they did their research, but in the human body, 
It doesn't work that way. So if we're giving prescriptions, we're down-regulating something in the system. But if we're using nutrients and supplements and food, we are up-regulating the body's ability to do what it's supposed to do. And it is quite miraculous how the body can heal itself when it's given the right tools. Right. Well, yeah, and I think that that is just so important. And, um, you know, as I was listening to you talk, you know, we know that most children who have autism or ADHD usually have a parent who has some kind of an inflammatory um, thing going on with them or some kind of a, um, um, a gut-related problem or issue. Um, and so I think it's really kind of a good idea that maybe when you do this, you don't just take your kids and go, I'm just going to change my diet for you. We're going to change the whole family's diet. And like you were saying earlier, most likely everybody is going to see um, some kind of benefit from it. Absolutely. And I, I see that all the time. I, I see that quite often. And, and, and they, they seem so surprised and shocked by it. And, and it's, it's, it's funny that most of the, we, we're just not taught. We're just not taught at a young age and through school. And, you know, we went through this whole process of, oh, hey, look, you can push a button and your food is ready. And, and moms are like, yes, that works for me. Um, and now that we're in this place where we're realizing that all these foods and the toxins that are in or whatever, we have to backtrack and now go back to wash, chop, cook. That's, people are not happy about that. So I think a little piece of it, um, you know, it's frustrating, but when you start realizing why there's these chemicals in the food and it has nothing to do with our health or trying to nourish our society as a whole, these are, these are industries, it's companies, they're trying to make a profit. So what we need to do as consumers is to, you know, sift through the BS and the marketing that's on the front of the package, read our labels and understand that all those ingredients that are in there, they're not, they're not to be food for us. They're meant to help that, that product be more profitable so it can taste better. So they'll put more sugar in it or maybe put more sugar in it so it's addicting so that you want more or put the crazy coloring in it to attract a child. Um, and when you start realizing that that's what that is, it no longer looks appetizing. When you start really kind of educating yourself on what, what food is, what it's meant for, eat with intention, feed your child with intention. Um, you know, the younger you start, oh, if I could get to everybody when their kids are just little, it, it's, it is a lot easier because if you don't offer them um, the addictive foods and the aggressive foods and the toxic foods, they won't then become addicted to them and have more issues. But it, it is hard. I, you know, I'm not sitting over here, you know, being flippant, like, hey, you guys all need to keep feed your kids more veggie. I know it's hard. I've been there. <laughs> In fact, I, one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about what I do and work with families is because I did it all wrong. <laughs> so when uh, our doctor first put us on a gluten casing soy free diet, and then we were on an anti candida diet and things like that. Oh man, I went through my kitchen like some kind of tornado and I got rid of everything and all his favorite things. And of course I made the whole family go on it because again, I, I never ever encourage people to isolate their kid on the spectrum or their kid and, and only make them be on the diet. Everything that I say and everything that I usually do is it, it benefits everybody. So it doesn't make sense to isolate or have things around that they can't have because some of these kids, man, they are smart and they will hunt it out. I remember finding my kid at the top of the cupboards, getting these hidden stash of cookies one time, almost gave me a heart attack. But <laughs> it was, so, but what I, the, the thing is, is I tortured my family and made it very, a miserable process. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be overnight. What I try to tell families, it's progress, not perfection. If you can start with one thing, you know, even if it's upgrading that chicken nugget from, you know, the junk version that's full of hydrogenated oils and artificial colors and flavors to a better version one, maybe the, you know, Applegate Farms organic or you know, just even incrementally try to change it. And I know, I know that there is someone on the other side of that screen right now saying, oh, sister friend, there's no way my kid knows what brand. And I get that, but there's a reason why he knows that brand. And it's either because there is a chemical or something in that food 
that he is now addicted to and it's causing him a problem. And um, I'll get a lot of feedback from parents where they'll argue with me saying, oh, you know, I think gluten's fine for my kid or this is just, it's fine for my kid. He doesn't have any rashes or anything showing me that this is not good for him. Like everyone expects some kind of like peanut allergy where it's going to be an anaphylactic shock. But what is interesting is that the human body is amazing and it'll build up a tolerance to these toxins, right? So I try to compare it to if someone were to start smoking, if you were to pick up a cigarette and you're not a smoker, if you were to pick up a cigarette and start smoking it, you would cough, right? You would feel like you're going to choke and, and you would cough. But after a few times and, and more practice, you stop coughing when you inhale smoke. Does that mean that cigarette is better for you than it was the first time you coughed? No, it just means that your body sort of did what it does and it tried to build up some kind of tolerance for it. Um, and that's the same with some of these toxins in food. The body has built up this like sort of wall it's trying to help you. It's putting your immune system in major overdrive. So instead of being able to fight all the little viruses that are out there and things like that, the, the immune system is taxed because it has been fighting the toxins that you are putting in your body, let alone the toxins. I mean, we could have a whole other presentation about the toxins that are in our environment, right? Like that's a, that's a whole other thing in itself. But how in the heck are we supposed to be able to fight these toxins if our immune system is overactive from the things that we're putting in and we're calling food, but they're actually damaging the system and they're burdening the detoxification pathway. They're poisoning our brain um, and, and they're, they're breaking down the system. Yeah, and I think it's like just reflecting on my son. We chose at one point because he wasn't sleeping through the night and he would get up every single night at two o'clock in the morning, every single night crying, upset, all of this stuff. So we made him gluten free. And then as we started adding, and that stopped, he started sleeping through the night. So we started adding gluten in and we could start to tell that it wasn't gluten. It was it was something in certain foods that was giving him the problem. So like goldfish are no-no like, like goldfish are like yeah. evil for my son like yeah. they do very bad things yeah. um so we don't give him goldfish anymore because it had such a negative reaction for him but it wasn't the gluten it was like you know, color. and that's the thing too sometimes it's not a direct thing like sometimes um, some of my families get frustrated that they can't isolate any one particular food or something but um, the truth is, is that our gut is about 85% of our immune system, right? And not only that, but that's where our digestion and absorption of our nutrients happen. So if you don't have a healthy gut, you can't absorb nutrients. So many of these foods that we talked about are what we call anti-nutrients, including the gluten and casein. They're anti-nutrients. They, they destroy the gut lining. When that happens, they, they're indirectly causing some of these problems right so it's it may not be just like that particular food but the gut system has now been broken down from many different foods and anti-nutrients or whatever so now some other unrelated food so i'll find that many times in food sensitivity panels we'll run a food sensitivity panel um, which again that's that's a huge topic in itself but we'll briefly kind of touch on it what happens is then if someone comes back and their panel shows like a boatload of sensitivities that they're, you know, reacting to many different kinds of foods, it usually is a good indicator that their gut is not intact. And a lot of those undigested food particles are seeping out into their system and creating an immune response. So the immune system's job is to identify an invader that doesn't belong and, you know, maybe encapsulate it with an immune complex or any number of different things it does. But then it's tagged as a, an invader, right? So the next time they eat that, it could be something healthy. It could be a pineapple. It could be a strawberry. It could be um, any number of things. But because the body reacted to it, now we're, our immune system is in you know hypersensitivity mode and it'll react to it. So what I find is when sometimes we, we end up having to do an elimination diet and we eliminate a boatload of toxins all at one time. Um, and then when one thing gets put back in, we can identify it better because it's more sensitive now. Once the immune system has kind of deflamed a bit and, and now it can sense it better. It's kind of like um, Dr. Baker has that amazing um, quote. I love it. it he says, um, if you stepped on a tack, you know, 
taking Tylenol or is, is not going to help that, right? You're eventually going to have to remove that tag. Like that tag is still there. It's still causing a problem and you can continue to mask that pain or mask that symptom, but it's still going to be there. And then he goes on to say that if you have two tacks in your foot, just removing one tack will not reduce your symptoms by 50%. So that makes sense, right? So we have all these toxins coming in from every which way. And sometimes, you know, just removing one, like gluten, and not all the rest of this jasmine tabs we just talked about, we're going to still have serious disturbances in the force, and it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so um, participants, I have unmuted you all. If you have any specific questions for Denise, um, go ahead and Feel free, we've got about um, five more minutes. So we can take a couple questions if you have any. I hear someone typing away. I don't see anything. Are you gonna tell me what they're asking? Because I can't see, I can hear typing though. Do you, do you see the chat box up now, Denise? Mm -hmm. No? No. Okay, um, so Ryan asked, um, five to six times a year, I go through mood swings as well as hormonal and chemical imbalances. For a week or a little longer, um, as I told you, I have autism. Um, I also take meds. Is this normal um, to have these kinds of mood swings um, five to six times a week a year? Uh, having mood swings only five to six times a year is that what he said? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it's funny how things go in cyclic rounds. It, it is possible. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but. Um, it is definitely common for, you know, behaviors and aggression and um, agitation and symptoms to, to flow with the toxicity in not just your food, but in your environment. If you're not getting enough sleep or if you're under more stress and it'll create a hormone imbalance and disturbances <coughs> throughout the system. So that's it's, it's not an isolated one for one thing. It's not like we say, oh, well, I ate this cookie, so it's going to have this exact effect. And and it's different for each individual. We all have our own bio-individuality and we have our own unique system and we respond differently to different things at different times. So depending on everything else that's going on in our lives, whether it was street stress or we didn't get enough sleep last night, so today we're more sensitive to things or um, we were on vacation and so maybe we're handling a little more or we're having a little bit more treats or booze or who knows what. Um, bacteria have a huge part in all of this as well we didn't even touch on that but um we have more bacterial cells in our body than we do human cells and those suckers are in charge of a whole lot of stuff they talk to our brain they help us absorb nutrients they block nutrients they uh, there's a whole lot going on in that story so that also will affect um our mood our behavior our ability to think um so having a good healthy microbiome is super important and everything that we just talked about today Every single one of those things affect the microbiome. Awesome. Yeah, I love the mic. Uh, so I'm a big nerd. I was a geneticist for years. And oh, the, the yeah. whole microbiome thing is just fascinating. Um, it's super fascinating. So it goes very complicated really quick, too. <laughs> exactly. But we're learning a lot. We're learning a lot these days. It's just, uh, there's, so, there's just, there's too much to uh, know all of it right now. So we just got to do our best to maintain that integrity. And most of us have either been on antibiotics or we're eating food that had antibiotic put in it. So um, it, it kills those bacteria, good and bad. So we have to be very mindful of those little buggers because they're super important. Um, so we have another question. So can you recommend a good children's book or a visual tool um, that's kind of aimed at kids to get them on board with eating healthier foods? That's pretty You know great. what? I, I wish I had my resources here next to me. I don't, but if you message me on one of my forums or my uh, website, I, I can get you a list. Or maybe, you know what, that being said, I will make a post with some of my favorite reads because there are, there are quite a few actually out there, which are pretty great because um, that's one of my, my, my goals is to start an education program for kids too, because I promise you, if you get your kids involved, this process is a whole lot better. Like if you let them pick out a new vegetable each week and, and, and don't, don't force them to eat it. Let's touch it, play with it, cut it up, make it different shapes and let them hang out with it for a bit and get familiar with it. 
Um, Cause that's one of the things we work on with like sensory uh, issues and processing disorders. Is sometimes, you, you know, it's a kind of weird, funky thing to come at you with some new texture, smell, taste, or whatever. So getting kids involved and excited about it and getting them to understand it because they're, they're just small humans. Yes, they're kids, but they're human beings too. And just like the rest of us, it's really hard to accept what you don't understand. And just because mom is barking at you that this is what you're supposed to eat and this is not what you're, it doesn't always like settle in. So if you can get them to understand why it is, they will make their own choices. And that was a big breakthrough for, for us when my son, um, it sounds terrible, but luckily he was getting acne as a teenager when he would sneak and have things off of his diet. And it really motivated him to stick to his diet. And then as he started to get older, even today, so he just turned 23, and he will openly say, like if he ate something or went off his diet somehow or whatever, um, he, he chooses to go back on and he makes the choice to cook and do all these things and he rarely eats out. And when he does, he orders everything, you know, special and all, and his friends make fun of him to no end. And he doesn't care because he knows how he feels and he understands how his body works and he understands the physiology and what will happen if he eats this one thing. Um, and so, you know, getting kids involved is amazing. And I will, I will try to get that resource either up on social media or message me and I will send you um, a list. Yeah, that's, thank you. That'd be really wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was another question about, um, uh, she said she can't find the name Roy official on Facebook. Um, so um, if you, does well, the PowerPoint warrant, if they just click on that link right there? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it works that way. Um, no. So no. what I will do is I will always, as long as you signed up um, to be a part of this webinar through um, Dane, I have your email address and I will send a copy of this presentation with all of the links that she's provided so that you can just kind of click on that link for her Facebook page and her Instagram page, which is actually how I found Denise in the first place. Um, that way you'll, you'll be able to click on it and link to it. Um, if you didn't sign up that way, you can just send me an email at Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-E at DanesUSA.com. And, um, and I'll make sure that you get everything all of the information and you can also there's a link to um all the social media on our website which is denisevoit.com um so you could go there and you know hit the links to both the instagram or facebook or whichever you prefer or both if you if you have that kind of time um <laughs> i know it's hard to find time for that kind of stuff um so we have um, another question and it says, um, fruits are a big part of my grandson's diet. How do we transition him from fruits to vegetables? That's a tricky one too. Yeah. So it's one of those things um, where, you know, the, the, the smoothie, fruit smoothies are the best way, but if they're, they like to eat fruit, um, I recommend going with the sweeter vegetables first and try to marry up with the textures that they're already used to. So beets and carrots are pretty pretty sweet. Jicama is sweet too, but they're also crunchy. So if the, if your kid doesn't like the crunch, so what I'll find is that some, some kids, if you cook it first, you cook the vegetable first, not only does it get some of the, the calm down some of the bitterness, but it also makes it less crunchy. So then they'll tend to eat it. I like um, the new right now, there's dehydrated vegetables out there as a snack. In fact, I should, I should grab it right now. There's this great new brand of cauliflower, um, I know it sounds, for anyone who doesn't eat vegetables, that sounds disgusting, but there's a buffalo flavor and there's a, a cheese flavor that's not cheese, don't worry, no dairy. Um, and it, they're super good and a lot of kids really like them because they're crunchy and they're not dried in the way that, um, so like if you get dried fruit, it really concentrates that sugar and many times they use chemicals and things that we don't want, sulfites and things that will agitate the system. So we don't want those, but now, there's um, the freeze dried where they they don't they don't concentrate it. Kids like those. They're crunchy. They're soft. They're tasty, um, and they have all the different. They've got beets and carrots and and those kind of things. Stay away from the the marketing and the ones that say that they're a veggie chip. Read yeah. your labels because many of those they're just a dang potato chip, and then they sprinkle a little bit of spinach powder on it to turn it green. And and there's no vegetable in that. Mm -mm. <laughs> well, that's what I was wondering. So. 
So maybe you could also just send me the name of that company because I think that's hard too is that the marketing departments are always like, oh, it's super healthy. It's got vegetables. And it's like, no, it doesn't. You yeah. know, so it's like, how do you know which brands actually, you know, still maintain the nutritional integrity of that fruit that they're promoting? Yeah. So, you know? yeah. So yeah. I'm constantly trying to teach yeah. people, read your labels, read your labels, read the ingredients, not just the picture on the front that looks like there's something healthy in there. Turn it over. And even not just the table, the table is really useful to isolate right out the gate how much sugar is in there. But what I do, go to that little microscopic, bust out those reading glasses for that little tiny, tiny font on there that tells you what's actually in there. And when you start reading it and you start seeing a whole bunch of words that you don't know what those are and the very, and those ingredients are listed in order of the amount that's in the product. So if there's crap, 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 and then at the bottom, there's like a little tiny bit of spinach powder, the, you know that there's, there's not a whole lot of nutrients in that in that uh food the closer you get to the whole food the better it's going to be but i know that's a hard transition and fruit is high in fructose so it's high in sugar so that has hijacked our kids taste buds to go from a sweet yummy grape to a broccoli head that's not going to happen so you've got to find those incremental like we work on that with kids there's like those incremental changes that are similar in nature or texture to one of your kids' favorites, but it there's there is no direct a vegetable that's going to be exactly like the fruit because fruit is high in fructose, veggies are not. That's why that's why we're promoting more of the veggies. So sometimes it's just a game you have to play. It takes patience. It it is frustrating. I mean, I work with families. I I know I've been there too. I mean, my son, I. In fact, my own self, I didn't eat vegetables as a kid. My mom didn't like vegetables, so we didn't eat vegetables. Every once in a while, we had a canned vegetable put on that table, and guess who was sitting there last at the table just waiting until bedtime so I could go to bed <laughs> and not have to eat it. It was like a nightmare. Um, but now, if you if you met my son, if you went out to it, he eats vegetables like they're candy. He loves them. You find a way to cook them, to prep them, to, you know, with yummy oils or yummy seasonings, and you can... The riced ones, actually, I want to say the riced and the noodle veggies are probably saving the planet right now. They're making it so much easier to uh, squeeze in veggies because you can do, um, you can sneak in riced cauliflower in just about anything. I mean, it's so um, mild in flavor and texture that it's just easy to hide. Um, so Switching from fruits to vegetables is hard, but, but um, increment is what I tell people. Just little by little, keep trying to introduce them to more and more and try to reduce that, the option of the fruit. Um, certainly don't, what I, I don't recommend, it doesn't usually work out, very rarely will it, but I do not recommend serving the fruit and the vegetable together because mm -hmm. you eating one thing that's sweet and then the thing that's kind yeah. of bitter and tight. It just doesn't, that just doesn't work out. It's better to just have the option at least temporarily when you're trying to get them used to or trying to try new things. Because otherwise, I mean, think about it yourself. Take a bite of a grape and then go take a bite of a more bitter vegetable. They don't really go together. Now, some some do. Some of the sweeter vegetables, like we said, you know, carrot and beet, um, they, they are a little bit sweeter. Hikma is pretty sweet as well. Well, so we have, um, I think we have time for one more question, and um, it's kind of a mix of a participant question and my own personal question. So, okay. um, like I told you, my my past life was as a geneticist, and, you know, I I kind of believe that this pattern of autism is in our family, but we are not as affected, myself and my dad, sorry, Dan, um, you know, I think we have some um, but we are not as affected as my son and my daughter is. And so it's kind of like one of those, okay, so is this a question of nature or nurture or both? So is there something going on biochemically that is altering the genes that are already there and overexpressing things and kind of wreaking havoc within the system? Or do you think that this is just the general, like, toxins are bad, stay away from them. Maybe they're not doing anything genetically, but maybe they're just exacerbate so, the problems that are already there? That's a great question. So genetics are a funny thing. You know, everyone thinks that genetics are written in stone and they're not. So we have that whole field of epigenetics where we know that we can turn on or off 
the genetic expression um, with environmental toxins, foods, behavior, sleep, stress, all these things. So sometimes even if you have the same genes as a family member or whatever, you you might not have the same expression of those genes. So it, something will react in you differently than your son or whatever. And so if he has an outward expression of, this is where it gets complicated with um, autism, is the outward expression of something that's going on on the inside may be different for different kids, and but still it's diagnosed based on the expression, right? The no eye contact, the lack of social behavior, all these things. But that doesn't help us understand what's going on on the inside. So it really takes some digging to figure out what's going on on the underlying biochemistry of each child and how their specific body is expressing that issue. And unfortunately, so that's where I think it's a bit controversial in how they diagnose this and why they diagnose that, um, these things and um, not look at biomedical treatment. So for me, it's a no-brainer that anybody who has um, any kind of um, autism in their family or ADHD, or, I feel like it's a medical issue, not just a psychiatric issue where there's some controversy there, where people think it's a psychiatric issue and a behavior issue and a this, this and I don't believe that. I believe that we all have our own underlying biochemistry and it's all individual and the way it's expressed all always depends on how our body handles those other environmental toxins. So um, that's a, a big broad way of saying, hey, we're all individuals and our, our genes are not set in stone and the way they express themselves is going to make a difference and make us each individual and how, how we react. Yeah, yeah. Well, Denise, thank you so much for coming on today. And um, it was a really fabulous talk. And like I said, something that isn't really talked about within the autism community when we talk about nutrition and food. Everybody, like I said, goes casein-free, you know, yeah. gluten-free, but you are 100% correct. I mean, we really need to address the toxins especially because our kids don't detox well they, exactly that's that's the bigger problem because this particular population is is more sensitive um and i this is this applies to everybody in all kids i mean kids that are being stamped and labeled with behavior issues and hyperactivity and things that nope you know what we just poison their poor little brain and that's that's why they're in um <laughs> overdrive right now but we're not talking about it we're not educating people on it people aren't understanding it but i think when people hear it the way i present it it seems simple and it makes sense it's just not easy to make these changes because the way that society is set up right now we're going against the grain if we try to everything that i just said get rid of all those things i mean go down the grocery store pretty much 90 percent of the stuff that's in the standard grocery store i mean you just can't have i i went into like hyper mode when i was at the natural product expo i'm like this is what the grocery store should look like there was all these options of you know gluten free casein free all natural all these things it was amazing it was awesome but you walk through the grocery store and or sometimes i'll do kitchen makeovers with families and they're just there's everything in their cabinet in their fridge either has one or two or five of those toxins in the product. I mean, the it, it just simple things you wouldn't even think would have these things. Like, I mean, ketchup, come on. Why in the heck does one tablespoon of ketchup have two teaspoons of sugar? And on top of that, it's high fructose corn syrup, which is super toxic. And then if your kid's anything like mine was, he ate more ketchup with his eggs than he did eggs. So it was, you know, those kind of things. And they add up all day long. That's the other problem. Like the, you know, you look at your label and there's X amount of this and this, but that's just one food. How many foods do you eat all day? And how many days in a row does it accumulate and stay in the system and then become toxic and, and really weigh heavy on the brain and the gut and the system. And um, it's, it's, this is a real issue. It's a real issue. And not just for this population, they just happen to be very sensitive to it, but just as our society as a whole, it's a real problem. But what I tell people is you could do your part. You are the consumer. You drive the market. If this is what you want and you don't want that poison and that junk, because I promise you, they can make it without. If you look at um, Europe and other countries, 
there's places where the some of the stuff that's in our food is not legal there. If you look at Kellogg's, they have certain brands of cereals that are geared towards kids and fun shapes and colors. But the one here is full of artificial colors and flavors and additives. But the one there, it's not. So you know that they can make it. They choose not to because they make more profit off of the cheaper forms and the toxic ingredients. But it's our job as consumers to say, we're not going to buy that stuff. That's not what I'm feeding my kid. I'm not going to poison my kid because the responsibility falls on us to take care of ourselves. And it's harder to find the things. And sometimes it takes more effort and work or maybe cost more, but what's the price? You're gonna pay the price eventually one way or another. Either you're gonna pay the price for the, the higher cost of the food or you're gonna pay the price in medical bills or um, any number of things, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. People mm -hmm. like watch the rate sensitive and it's like, well, you're right, at the end of the day, you're gonna pay for it no matter what. So <laughs> would you rather have a healthy, healthy kid who's not as hyperactive yeah. you know, and not going to the doctor and you're paying it up front? Or would you rather have a really difficult child who is suffering, really, you know? Right. And I'd rather pay the extra, you know, few bucks for the natural version and get, a, you know, an extra couple hours sleep at night, right? <laughs> like you put it like that, most parents will go, oh yeah, you're right. I'll pay the extra $2 for that, that box of granola bars versus this one. Um, and it just we're just not thinking like that. It's not it's not overly complicated. It's just that we're we're just not thinking like that. We we buy the foods that our mom bought or that we've seen on the market or that the kids eat. And we, you know, kids at school they're seeing what their kid is eating next to them. They want that food, and so it really needs to be a a, a, a larger effort. We need to spread the word, and I'm trying to do my part, but you know. It's just me. Because <laughs> everyone else, when you talk to other dietitians or nutritionists that specialize in autism, they're really talking a lot about the specialty diets and the GAPS diet and the gluten casein. And, and those are all effective as well. I work with all of those and, and they are, they're extremely effective, but they're not as, effect, as effective if you don't have this under handle. And also ABA therapy, speech therapy, all those therapies are less effective if you don't have this underway. If, if you have a good solid diet and you're not adding toxins to the form, they're gonna do better in their, their therapies. And then those therapies are expensive and very time consuming. So you wanna get the most bang for your buck there. Make sure that you're giving a solid platform for your child to absorb those therapies. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up, but Denise, this was really wonderful and no technical issues. You did great. Uh, <laughs> we really appreciate it. Thank you all for um, those who joined and for those who watch later. Um, we appreciate you being here. Again, this is um, Seeing Tacos as Webinar, part of our webinar educational series. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed this and have a good day. Thanks, Michelle.